I'm Colleen Kemp and you are listening to You Might Know Her from With Damien and Anne. Howdy, howdy. Old Lang Syne, baby. <laughs> I love Old Lang Syne. Do you have a feeling about it? Yeah, of course I love it. It's so great. I was like, Naomi just told me that she hated Old Lang Syne. I was like, I love that song. It like makes me deeply emotional. Oh, I love it. I don't know why I love it. I just think it's a good earworm, you know, at, at minimum. But I also like the sentiment. I agree. I have no idea what it means, but I do. <laughs> I did Google it. Re- I did Google it just like two days ago, and I forget now. <laughs> I was like, what's the translation? Welcome to another episode of You Might Know Her from our first of 2022. Oh, it's good to be back with you. I'm Anne, and this is my beautiful colleague over here, Damien. We're in our respective homes back in New York City. Luckily, we were both able to safely travel and see a little bit of family this holiday. We hope the same for you, or if you were able to spend time by yourself, with friends, quarantining with your TV or a book, I hope that you are happy and healthy, and we are welcoming you back to our show where we shoot the shit with each other, and what else do we do, Damien? We always interview an actor, a woman or a non-cis performer about their career, their life. We love a little bit of Hollywood or Broadway gossip while we're at it, and we always Mm. sandwich, you know, we always make that the meat of our bullshit sandwich here. (laughs) (laughs) So we have a lot to get into with this week's guest, but there's a lot to cover because we haven't seen each other in a long time. And I just wanted to tell you that something happened to me yesterday that I haven't told you about that has never happened to me in going on 21 years of living in New York City. So I was out for a walk yesterday and the temperature was dropping. It was super cold yesterday. Beautiful sunset, like a spectacular sunset in New York City. I had gone on a walk with our dear friend, Alex Munoz, and I was walking back uptown and I was crossing on like 155th Street, maybe. Anyway, it's like where there's that garden that has the wicked, like the wicked garden. Do you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Broadway musicals, wicked garden. Anyway, I was walking. I had my headphones in and I was just walking west and someone ran up behind me and hit me in the side of the head and kept running, (laughs) like hit me very hard in the side of the head and kept running and then like, turned around and looked at me as he was running past me and I was so stunned I couldn't do anything except I just like I was so I was so shocked like I was okay I wasn't like knocked out I was okay but I was like fuck you fuck you it was all I could get out of my mouth but I really wanted to like I don't know what I wanted in that moment, but it was very shocking. Honestly, like there's been these stories about women getting hit in the head with hammers. So I'll be happy to just like be hit with whatever he hit me with that was like not a brick or a hammer. But it was so jarring. It was super strange. That being said, it was a beautiful sunset (laughs) and I made it home. Safe and sound. But I really like, I really wanted to scream something else at him. But I don't know, like also like it was good that I didn't engage. Like I don't need to engage with a person who's clearly unwell or just like a huge dick. Are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> but, but it's like, A, humiliating. B, you're like, I know things like this happen everywhere. It really was just like, you hear about these things happening. You're like, what do you do? And luckily, I was not injured. It was fine. It was just like some idiot fuck. Was it a young person? Like a child? Like a teenager? No, no. He was like 35. Oh, okay, cool. Like an adult person. <laughs> an adult person. It reminds me of when I was getting off the school bus. Or no, I wasn't off the school bus, but I was walking home from a friend's home in the suburbs, you know, when I was like 14, 15, 16. And someone threw a dildo out of the w- window <laughs> into the suburb and it like hit me in the head. And Wait, like they threw it out of their car and we were walking and it like hit me in the head. And then I looked down and it was a dildo. Oh and I was like, wow. <laughs> it's, sh- it's shocking because, like, A, I would never waste a dildo to, like, throw at a stranger. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it was, like, dirt. It was, like, dirty. I feel like they found it somewhere. It was really sad. Like, not dirty oh, with, like, dang. not, like, dirty with poop, but it was, like, in the mud. <laughs> I'm so sorry. People I remember it felt like so I was, like, awful. I felt like it was, like, I was in, like, Stand By Me. It felt like I was, like, a, like a little nerd <laughs> in a teen movie about, like, coming of age. Right. And I was, like, I'm going to fucking get them. I was so mad. And I was, like, well, they drove away. Like, what am I going to do? Also, like, what would I have done, right. you know? Right. And it's interesting like my first reaction was like anger and then humiliation and then I wanted to cry but like I was fine not because I was hurt but maybe because I was humiliated I'm not sure anyway it was very shocking and I'm sorry that somebody threw a dildo at you (laughs) thank you so much (laughs) that would be fun if somebody did that to me here I would laugh more I mean I still would be shocked but I would say good work 
That's funny. <laughs> It's been such a weird time. I, you know, I've, I think we both at this point, time of this recording, been fortunate enough not to get Omarion, but, <laughs> but I have been essentially quarantining and I have been watching yeah. so much TV and I feel like I could Same. really talk about a lot of it right here. And I'm wondering if our listeners are watching all of the things. I'm going to tell you, I'll just give you a little laundry list of what I've watched. Yeah, same. Yep, Since the go. holidays, I watched all of the sex lives of college girls on HBO Max. I watched all of Harlem on Amazon Prime. I watched the second season of Emily in Paris. I don't recommend it, but I did do it. And I caught up in real time to Yellow Jackets, which I had not, I don't think I had started prior to the holiday break. I'm not sure actually, but uh, those, and then I've also watched a ton of movies. I watched The Lost Daughter. I watched Don't Look Up. I watched Being the Ricardos. I just really oh have God. been going hard on <laughs> content. I appreciate you. I also have been doing as much catching up as possible. I, when I'm home in Missouri with my parents, like, the kind of TV we watch is really like competition reality show. Mm-hmm. So we watched The School of Chocolate, which I highly recommend if you like cooking shows. Love the French chocolatier that is like the head honcho there. He's great. So the things that I've watched also, I'm three episodes into Yellow Jacket, so I'm not fully caught up. I'm excited to talk to you about that. I caught up and finished all of the last season of Insecure, which I was obsessed with until the last two episodes, which I think they really fumbled. But I really loved the first eight episodes of the last season. I thought it was spectacular. Of course, we're watching in just like that in real time. Oh, my God. Which just continues oh my God. to we evolve in a episode. really could... strange and fascinating way. <laughs> in classic fashion for me, I went back and watched White Lotus, which is now like a year and a half old. <laughs> it's not that old. And, of course, I finished Pen15 mm. uh, before Christmas, which is still, I think, my favorite thing that I've seen in a really long time. I just want to say about Yellow Jacket. So for those of you that aren't starting it yet, please start it so we can talk about it and send us DMs. I am not fully caught up, so I will be probably by next week. But I just wanted to say the first episode was so exciting to me because I thought they were setting up that main character, Jackie, to be Christina Ricci because they cast somebody that looks so much like Christina Ricci. And then at the end of the episode when it's revealed that it's not her, that it's Misty, I was like, holy shit, that was so satisfying because they cast somebody that like really looked like a young Christina Ricci. I, that's so- Do you think that was purposeful? I don't know. I haven't, I tweet it because I don't know that I've seen anyone acknowledge it, but I thought the exact same thing. So maybe it was intentional. Yeah, because Christina Ricci, I'm not sure what show she's on, but I love that Mm. she's like doing something. I love it. She's on like a Mark Cherry show. Yes, yes. And yeah, she is not the character that I thought she was going to be. Like I just made the assumption that she was the lead, which of course she is one of. I mean, it really is, I guess... Melanie Linsky is sort of the is oh, the who's so good, so just incredible. good. I love her. She contains multitudes. I loved like, her for so long. She's so good in every single thing that she's in. It's so good to see her like be the lead role here. I also am really into Tawny Cypress. Has she like appeared yet? Yes. I was. I don't know that what I know yeah, yeah, her yeah. from. I'm. I, I'm. You might know her from something. I'm sure I can Google and we'll find it. But I have been really into watching what she's doing, and of course, it's always mm-hmm. a pleasure to see Juliette Lewis. Unfortunately, a Scientologist, but I love oh. her. I love her too. I, yeah, I feel like it's like if the wilds was good. That's absolutely um, what so it is. That's, yeah. And I kept worrying that there was going to be like a supernatural element. And I know I'm only three episodes in, but I'm like, I know I'm worried that there's going to be like, there's like a monster in the woods or something that I don't care about. But that being said, it still is just really nice to see a show like led by women and Millie Linsky, like killing rabbits. It's just so good. Yeah. Her skinning so the good. rabbit was like, I like, there's a lot of moments where I have to talk myself into like not turning my head or covering my eyes because it's like, I don't want to say it's gory or violent. I don't think those are the right words. I guess graphic is the right word where it's just like some of the things and you'll continue to see this. Like every episode, there's at least one moment where you're like, oh, it's like so yeah. a lot. Yeah, I don't know. It's like there's something fun about I like I'm invested in the young women's stories in a way that I kind of thought. Yeah, I, I think the young actors are really I good. I think they're good. And I think I thought that I wouldn't care. And I think I thought I would draw too many comparisons to the wilds, which, you know, I was obsessed with per your recommendation. And then you turned on it and I, you would not, I you turned, would not book club it with me after it. You're like, Damien, we talked about <laughs> it enough. Anyway. Yeah. I, I think I thought there would be too many comparisons to the wilds for me based on the first, like the premise. But then I soon forgot because I feel like it's more, yeah. it's certainly more interesting. And also because you get to see 
there's this like added element of like who's alive, who's not alive, who made it, who's are there other adults that we're gonna meet along the way? Like a season two gonna right. introduce more people. I didn't watch Lost though, and I think that some of my concerns for the future of the show, I assume that whatever yeah. happens in this season, I hope will be satisfying for what I've been watching. But my fear is that there are you know it's already been renewed for a season two and I'm like okay but like I know that people had complaints about like Lost continuing to like add new right. survivors and like new like supernatural elements that were not introduced in the initial pilot it does seem like there's some sort of supernatural thing going to be introduced in terms of like ritualistic cannibalism hopefully doesn't involve a monster or like aliens or anything right. but anyway I was going to say, uh, this is what I meant to say about Insecure is like what I realized, Hannah and I were watching it and at the end it was like, oh, this is a really straight show. And it was like frustrating in that realization, although it's like it doesn't have to be for gay people. Do you know what I mean? Like not every show is for every audience. But I felt like the thing that was sort of surprising about Yellow Jackets or it was like, I guess, refreshing is that there is like a little bit of queerness in it that is like feels organic to the piece instead of sort of put upon it. So that is nice because I just like powered through Insecure really quickly and it felt like a very heteronormative storyline. So yeah, recommend Yellow Jackets very highly. And I just wanted to say, if I can pivot quickly, is that I feel like it's important to acknowledge the fact that we lost the great Betty White on New Year's Mm. Eve. New Year the day before New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve? It was on New Year's Eve. We lost Betty White in 2021 and it was you know, she lived a very full life. The People magazine cover was already out. But I had been watching Golden Girls episodes with my parents while I was home because it's like, I feel like it's one of the greatest TV shows of all time. I think that's undeniable. It holds up so well. I was watching all the like Christmas episodes. I think she was unparalleled. I think the show is unparalleled. So if you need comfort TV, I hope that you're indulging in both the Mary Tyler Moore show. We've lost everybody from that show at this point as of last year. And the Golden Girls, two of like the best things that have ever been on TV. Yeah, I watched some Golden Girls to prepare to like when I was like on New Year's Eve, I was watching a few episodes. I also rewatched that scene of the Great Herring War where she talks about the herring getting shot out of a yeah. cannon. And I know there's like a lot of lore around that episode. And I know that there's probably like better. I know there are better Golden Girls experts out there. But, you know, like this rumor sort of of like them breaking character and like the director keeping that in. But then also like was yeah. she improvising because at one point Rue McClanahan is like, you're lying or like you're making this up it's so good like the chemistry between I mean in in that scene it's the three of them I'm no Sophia but it's just like the chemistry between them is so unmatched by anything else you know it's and just like that wishes you know they wish it there are little glimmers of moments but it's like I'm literally holding on to the threads of Samantha's DMs and if that is like the thing that is the brightest light in an episode you know it's tough tell me is there a version where Samantha's coming back at the end of the season because otherwise what are they planting? I know. I feel like that's what's deeply disappointing is I was like, those things are giving me glimmers of hope that I think are ultimately just going to be dashed. But like maybe they brought back Laurel Holloman for the L word, but like she didn't shit talk the show and like she wasn't in a series of arguments with the lead of the show. So I don't know that it's going to, I just don't imagine that she's going to come back. I think if we give it five years, seven years and they did a movie, maybe Kim Cattrall would say yes. I just don't think it's going to happen in 2022. I thought that what was so satisfying about watching the DM exchange, and I think why so many of us, because it, it wasn't just like the mention of Samantha and seeing her text, it was the language s- felt somehow reminiscent of the way Samantha would speak. And that is like what we are missing from the show is this sort of candid, you know, straightforward, I don't know, just like it's a, it's the funny person. It's like the, they are missing the funny person. And Miranda, who was dry and funny in this version, mm. is not that character. And Charlotte, who's like zany and funny, was like, you know, she's like on a different planet. So it's just I, I feel yeah. like it's a loss. And it felt so fun to watch, you know, the Samantha in the phone be like, one of my finest hours or like, so glad your vagina is getting airtime. I was like, yes. Bring her back. Yeah, I know. The problem is that the show keeps telling us how funny Che Diaz is. And Che is like the worst character that's ever been on television. <sighs> che Diaz is my arch nemesis. Were you were you <laughs> hot for Miranda getting finger banged in the kitchen? Because a lot of folks were. Yes. Yeah. No, I was in that. Like, I totally at this point, whatever character they've made Miranda in this reboot I feel like Cynthia Nixon is playing it and so it's like okay great well that character really wants to get fucked by Che Diaz so (laughs) she does get fucked by Che Diaz in Carrie's Kitchen and I was like that it like worked for me it didn't like it wasn't like it didn't make sense and then finally that there was sex in the show that then like contributed to character and plot as opposed to feeling like we're watching Brady have sex or whatever it is or like big masturbate I feel like finally there was sex that was relevant to 
to like character development. So I liked that. And also the idea of getting like fucked as like a 55 year old woman in your best friend's kitchen while she's recuperating is funny to me. But I just find Che, who talks about like being a stand up, said Yas Queen, which I actually could not handle. DM me if you want to hang out again. I, I just can't believe this is like something that somebody decided to put in writing and then made it to air. And I love Sada Ramirez. I think they're very good. It's just like the character is insufferable. And we have to listen to Miranda say how funny they are over and over and over. And it's like Miranda, like maybe has a brain tumor. Like, what? Che Diaz is not funny. There was this, that scene where Miranda's like listening to Che's pod. It's like when she, it's like right before she fixes her alcoholism. Yeah. And she, <laughs> she's laughing maniacally. Yeah. And, and, the podcast. and Che's like, I was dating this person that was transitioning. And I was like, you're not transitioning to a different gender. You're transitioning to an asshole. And Miranda like cackles. And I was like, this isn't funny. <laughs> it's painful. Anyway, I will continue watching. I hope you're all continue watching. Please send us your thoughts and feelings on and just like that. And please start watching Yellow Jackets. Let us know what you're watching, what you're reading. I'm reading Detransition Baby, which I'm really enjoying. But guess what? It was on Carrie Bradshaw's shelf. So I don't know if that's like a toot or a boot, but I'm enjoying it. And I'm really dedicating myself to trying to read more in 2022. Whoo, Damien. I have to say, I really love y'all like DMing us about the stuff that you're watching or that we are watching collectively. It's such a joy. So um, please continue to do that and follow us or whatever. And and while you're on it, please leave us a review. Thanks to those of you that did leave us a review over the holidays. We so appreciate you. It was the best thing we could have received in 2021. Keep them coming in 2022, please. Okay, well, we have done a lot. Ooh. So should we get to the, the you know, the piece de resistance? Let's get to the meat and potatoes because it is a juicy dish. And that is, of course, the divine Colleen Camp. She graced our airwaves this week and we went very deep with her. I mean, she has a career that has spanned at this point five decades and has been in so many huge classic comedy hits, dramas like Apocalypse Now, and as we get into in the interview, is a connector of people. She has sort of transitioned into also being a producer and has this laundry list of credits that sort of has to be heard to be believed. I think the other thing that I would offer context for Colleen, because you'll see how like well connected in the industry she is. And as Anne mentioned, like not only an actor, but a producer. But Colleen also in some way is like Hollywood royalty, you know, like she like cut her teeth with like Francis Ford Coppola and Apocalypse Now, but then like also dated like Dean Tavalaris, also then was married for many, many years to John Goldwyn of The Goldwins, and they have a daughter together. So in all of these ways, like, she's just really connected, like, to ho- old Hollywood to, like, present day, and, like, everyone from The Goldwins to, like, Eli Roth. She is just very well connected, and I think very well liked, and you'll hear all of that, but I think that helps offer some context to, like, who exactly this woman is. Bye, bye, bye. You might know her from Clue, American Hustle, Election, They All Laughed, Police Academy 2 and 4, Die Hard with a Vengeance, Wayne's World, Valley Girl, Game of Death, Sliver, Wicked Stepmother, and Apocalypse Now. We are here finally with actress and producer Colleen Camp. Colleen, thank you for joining us on the show today. Of course. I'm so excited. Okay, we have so much to get into, but we wanted to start with something we discovered, which is that you appear in the 2015 Eli Roth movie, Knock Knock. And look, it's a one scene cameo, but you are so, so good in this. And we were tickled to learn that Roth had actually met you on a phone call when he was 20 years old. That's right. And years later, asked you to act and produce this film since he was such a fan of your work. So when we started doing our research, this was something that seemed sort of representative of your career in that you've worked with so many high profile directors, some of them repeatedly, like David O. Russell with American Hustle and Joy, Jonathan Lynn with Clue and Greedy, and one of our faves, Martha Coolidge, Valley Girl, Joy of Sex and Material Girls. So with a career that is, you know, spanned over these 40 years, what do you think it is about you in particular that makes you the sort of go to woman for these auteurs? I have always been a bigger thinker in terms of movies. I've always been a promoter Mm -hmm. of filmmakers and of talent. And I think that that has been an ingredient, whether it's been Peter Bogdanovich or David O. Russell, you know, or Herbert Ross, even when I did Funny Lady and then I did My Blue Heaven. Yeah. I think that people have collaborated with me beyond acting. So I'd look at a cut of Adam McKay's big short. I would help Adam strategically on the campaign. 
And so I was always more than just an actress in a film. And it was just by nature. Like, for example, recently I produced Above Suspicion, which Philip Noyes directed. I met Philip on Sliver. And so I've always been a lover of filmmakers. And I think that's why I've done repeat business, whether it's been as a producer or as an actress in a, in a movie with the filmmakers I love. I had a producerial nature. I always felt like I love putting people together, whether it was matchmaking, getting them married, whether it was putting the right architect with the right house. And I think that it was something inherent. And I never really thought of that as an extra perk. I remember Martha Coolidge said to me, I want you to have an associate producer credit on the city girl. And I started crying. Now, saying, oh, that's really wonderful. But I actually got her the million dollars. I actually got a lot of the elements for Valley Girl. I got Delia Javier, who was the art director and had worked with Dean Tavalaris on Apocalypse Now and Alex Tavalaris. I had Lee Purcell come in and act in Valley Girl. I had Freddie Forrest play my husband in Valley Girl. I had my neighbor, Mindy Tennant, do costumes. I had Gary Lowe do location scouting. We shot some of this and rehearsed in my house. So I had worked with Nick Cage, obviously not him, but I'd worked with his uncle Francis Coppola. And so I knew a lot of people and Martha met Nick Cage because she was doing something for Zoetrope called photo play. And I met her through Fred Roos. And when Martha first came out here, I became a big advocate of hers. I mean, she stayed at my house for three weeks when she first came out here from Boston and I think to answer your question about producing is that it really kind of was a protection because I ended up spending so much time with directors, watching their edits, going in to look at their cut, giving them notes. I remember on Valley Girl, I virtually set up a bidding war on the movie. I remember John Tarnoff was at MGM. Sarah Altschul was at the Lad Company. Sean Daniel was at Universal. And I had everybody come to the Sherman Oaks Galleria to watch the film. And there was a bidding war on the movie. So I was always almost, I guess, driven in an entrepreneurial way, in a sense. Mm -hmm. I just was always thinking about the good of the picture. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're like a connector, essentially, meaning, as you said, you're a big picture viewer that also is somebody that everybody likes, that you can bring people together. Thank you. I think so. I love that. So, Colleen, we have to get into this because we are obsessed with Clue. I'm sorry we are. I love it. You obviously play Yvette the Maid in the 1981 comedy classic. It is both of our favorite movies. So we have quite a few questions about Clue. We can keep it rapid fire if you'd like, but just bear with us. So first things first, the story goes that the competition for Yvette was quite tight with folks like Madonna, Jennifer Jason Lee, Demi Moore, all vying for the role. That's right. How did you know that? We did my research, Colleen. What do you remember about the audition process and, and what do you think ultimately gave you the edge? And, and is it true that you wore a French made costume to one of your auditions? I wore a French made costume. Here's what happened. <laughs> I had a manager who represented Jennifer Jason Lee, and they really wanted her for the part. I don't see it. I, I like her a lot. I don't see it. And I love Jennifer Jason. So what happened was I had a manager named Bobby Edrick and Elaine Rich, and they represented Fran Drescher, Donna Dixon, Jennifer Jason Lee. And my manager said there's this part in Clue, but Madonna wants it, Demi Moore wants it. They want Jennifer Jason. And I just was so excited about this um, part. Because I made a big mistake on a movie called Splash because Bruce Berman, who I was having lunch with at a restaurant called Hamptons, Bill Shepard, who was a big casting director for Disney, they wanted to meet me, Ron Howard, on Splash. And I read the script, and I don't know why, but I said, there is no way I am right for this part. So with Clue, I got my head around it really quickly, and I went, okay, first of all, I used to speak French, and you know, not fluently, but I took French in school, and I mm, okay. love the idea of being a phony French maid. And I wanted to have my posture a certain way. And there was something exciting, particularly, and I didn't even know who all the actors were at that point, but it was Tim Curry. And I went, I love the board game. And so I immediately called Robert Easton and I started phonetically working with the dialogue. And I liked the fact that there wasn't a huge amount of dialogue, but there was a lot of, I thought, 
I know this is going to sound weird, but it, it reminded me of Splash in a way that I should have gone up for that part just to go up for it and approached it differently. And I thought, well, with Clue, if there was something very funny about playing this kind of French maid and and but also very serious. And you know, me was a Melda. You know, I wanted to be like, you know, but it is dark upstairs. You know, I was like, there's something very funny about it. Would anyone go with me? I will. I will. No, thank you. <laughs> I, and I, the movie holds up brilliantly because brilliantly. I saw brilliantly. I mean, I saw it in San Francisco, and I thought it was so brilliant, brilliant. And I have like a laryngitis voice right now, but I mean, I remember shark's fin soup, Madame, and it was very <laughs> precise. And I remember what was probably one of the most exciting movies I've ever done in my life, probably next to Apocalypse Now, and they all laughed because. We had lunch every day in the commissary. Mm. It was an ensemble of great actors. And so when I went in, I put on a French maid's outfit. I was cast in the room. Jonathan Lynn was a theater director in, in London. And I think because also John Landis, who was also a producer, had cast me in Animal House and I chose to do Game of Death. I've done three movies with it. Deadly Games, Game of Death. And Death Game. And Death Game. But Jonathan Lynn loved me. And I think because I went for it. And I think that Clue, because it was very different than Smile mm. or Battle for the Planet of the Apes or They All Laughed. I think I knew I had to go in and create that character. And I created it perfectly, yes. I thought. Because I went in and I was the part. I was, hi, how are you? And then, Hello. <laughs> oh, both of these, I'm Frattens. I'm Frattens of the dark, you know. So I really, and I knew that the accent had to be there, but also a hint of she was a phony French maid and that I wanted to do a great accent. And Michael Kaplan designed those costumes, and I'm so upset because I wish to God I'd kept one of those three costumes. Yes. And you know what? Unfortunately, there's no costume that exists anymore because Michael Kaplan... At the time when they had studio, the studios were housing costumes, they would take pieces of costumes. So who knows, the skirt probably went on one show, the top went on another show. So those costumes, unfortunately, Clue weren't kept intact mm. and they were brilliant costumes. And I, I loved that movie. I remember the audition. I went into Paramount, I went on the audition. I knew when I left the room, I had the part. Mm. And it was, it was a very exciting experience. One of the things the sort of lore at this point was that Jonathan Lynn screened His Girl Friday for the cast yes. to sort of get into the milieu that he wanted for the film. I love that you knew that. Yeah. How so, did you know that? Well, we read an interview with you where you said that Eileen Brennan was like, you can tell this was before the method. They're just talking, which I'm very into. Did you have like a buddy on that set? Was it Eileen Brennan? Or was she like not in that place to be a buddy? I loved everybody. I loved Madeline. In fact, they all came to my 30th birthday, and I have a Clue board game with every single one of their signatures on it. Oh, my God. I From love Madeline that. to Michael McKeon, because Michael and I had worked in Daryl together. Mm. And remember, Chris Lloyd and I had done Track 29 together, oh, wow. and we'd done a movie called Bobo the Dog Boy. So, like, you weren't intimidated going in. You felt like some sort of camaraderie with this group of people. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And Leslie Ann and I were, like, real pals on it, and... And I went to her son's Christopher's sixteenth birthday and I love it. It was a great experience, that movie. And I love Deborah Hill and, and, and Linda Opes and, and I knew John Landis. So it was a very, very friendly set. Urban Legend says that there were four different endings scripted, even though only three made it to the final cut of the film. And so there's in some interviews, there's been some scuttlebutt that some of the fourth ending was filmed, but maybe scrapped. Like Wadsworth murdered everybody or Dobermans chased the whole cast. Your character isn't in a ton of the endings. Do you remember anything of this mysterious fourth ending now? I don't. I'd have to ask Jonathan Lynn. I, he has said in interviews that like he doesn't remember any of it and he has no copy of the script. But Michael McKean and <laughs> Tim Curry have sort of like, they've said things like, oh, I remember this. So I was just curious if you had anything in your memory that you were like, oh, I remember filming this. It sounds vaguely familiar, but I remember <laughs> that the big confusion of the movie was that they had it in different theaters with different endings and that Jonathan thinks in retrospect that confused people to what to see. Right. Right. It's a perfect film, in my opinion. I think it's perfect. Yeah. I don't know why 
it wasn't a monumental hit. I think the movie is brilliant. Totally. I think it's very smart. Totally. So smart. And luckily it's like gained, you know, this alternate life. So I think that it's one of these movies that I call a green flag movie that if somebody mentions that Clue is like important to them, it's like a automatic like green light for me for with that person. Like, oh, this person gets it. They understand me. I agree. Obviously, Yvette is hilarious, but also she's this sort of like buxom, very sexy broad. Right. And in Apocalypse Now, you appeared as a Playboy playmate and you cut your teeth in these sort of like cheeky exploitations, like swinging cheerleaders. And even in Police Academy, your character, you know, Kathleen Kirkland is still like billed as a quote unquote fox. So then, like, in the 80s, at some point, your hair color started to change, and, like, where you were classically blonde, you then were showing up as, like, brunettes and redheads. Was there any part of the work that you were doing that was a concerted effort to sort of distance yourself from that sort of, like, sexy bombshell that you had been cast as early on in your career? When you go back, this is a good question, when you go back and you look at some of the great, great, great comedy performances, whether it's Carol Lombard in my band, Gottfried, or Judy Holliday, or you look at Monroe, who's a genius actress. Agree. Absolutely. Genius. Yeah. When you think and you look at some like at Hogger, you look at any of her movies, brilliant, brilliant actress. Brilliant actress. Yes. I think there's a difference in an actress like a Carol Lombard or a Monroe that actually creates a character, is answering and listening, than somebody that is used only as an appendage. I remember that. Larry Mark once said to me, I said, I want that part in that movie. And he goes, Colleen, you're not a drag him through the mud girl. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're going to be fighting all the way. You're going to be, you know, in the same way Karen Allen was fighting with Harrison Ford and Raiders. Now, do blondes or brunettes get those parts? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it's interesting that it's interesting you say that, because if you even think about gentlemen prefer blondes, you know, think about it. It's the brunette that has more, you know, she's she's much more uh, on top of it than Laura L- Lott. Right, right. Oh my God, diamonds. But then, but then yet there's a turnaround when the, the, the father turns to Marilyn Monroe and says, don't tell me you're not marrying, something like, don't tell me you're not marrying my son for his money. She says, no, I'm not. I marry him for your money. <laughs> right, right, right. What? Right. She's been, like the idea she's, that she's been in control the whole time. She knows what she's doing. Yeah. Well, right, and he says, "Wait, we're not. What, what do you mean? She, well, what if you had a daughter when you and when you want her? Because wait, they said you were, you were, you you were, you weren't smart. You, I can be smart when I want to be. So, I do think that hair color, interestingly enough, they always go dumb blonde or legally blonde, or there's a there's a connotation with blonde. I think, for me, I remember in high school, one year I had my normal blonde hair, and then in eleventh grade." I dyed my hair black. And there's a picture of me with my hair. And I always looked, because I was obsessed with Vivian Lee and Grace Kelly. Mm. And so I always I had blue eyes. So I looked so different with dark hair that you would eat, that I looked like a completely different person. So I think there was something in me that loved experimentation with hair color. I mean, honestly, there are things that you show up in where you're completely like unrecognizable and it's really exciting. And I thought there was something more geared towards parts like in sliver sharon stone was blonde and philip noise said you have to be red yes i said i have to be red it was shocking when you came out you have to be red and then i liked the red and i kept the red and i do think when i wanted to take on more serious roles Mm -hmm. for some reason it seemed more viable to have you know even just in the red hair and uh Sliver. Can we talk a little bit about Sliver, which you mentioned, because sexual thrillers are my passion. And Sliver was like a blind spot for me that I knew I had to rectify at some point. So I was very excited to finally have a reason to sit down and watch Sliver. So as you said, it was you know, produced by Bob Evans, screenplay by Joe Esterhaus, who wrote Showgirls, of course. And I was obsessed with A, your red hair, and B, the fact that you know, Esther House gave you like these delicious lines. You were Sharon Stone's oh, sort of s- sex-starved assistant. At one point, Sharon Stone tells you, you've been spending too much time with your vibrator. And you reply, I certainly have. I'm getting a plastic yeast infection. <laughs> Frankly, it's like, it's so good. And I, we thought that you sort of perfectly captured the tone of the film in the sort of like wink to the audience with the dialogue. Like what kind of movie did you think you were making? Because that's the movie that we want to watch. I loved that part because it was almost like the sidekick 
the kind of Eve Arden mm. yes. Yes. sidekick. And I remember picking out my glasses. I I had to have very specific glasses for that. I love those those glasses. And so I had to have a certain kind of cat glasses. Mm-hmm. I love that part. I love working with Philip Noyce. I was so obsessed with that movie that I kept... This is the thing that really made me want to produce. I kept writing new endings to that movie because I didn't feel they had an ending. And all of a sudden that, that ending, it get a life, you know, but I... It was so... The was, ending is so strange. I actually couldn't believe that. It Just credit roll. Insane. Um, that was not the ending. They tried a whole bunch of endings. Mm. But I always felt that movie suffered from a really amazing ending. But maybe in retrospect, if I go back... I look at it, I'll say, oh, that ending's great. It turns, it becomes a different film in the last third, I would say. The first two thirds are like incredible, incredible. And then the reveals are sort of, yeah, it does not pay off in the end, but it is wild. It's definitely worth watching because it's so strange. You'll go, oh, it's a Softy Brothers ending or something. I mean, I mean, I mean, you don't know, it's experimental, it's Fellini. I mean, right, right, right. I mean, Sharon Stone I mean, shooting the TV screens. Yeah. Right. So because it was like a vigilante all of a sudden. So I don't know because maybe it's inspired. I think that Sharon, it was her first movie after Basic Instinct. I mean, she was a megastar. Yeah. And yeah. I think that I wanted to stick with a real Hitchcockian thriller. And I so I wanted an ending that was very traditional and Hitchcockian style. I've got to go back and see the movie because you're right. All of a sudden it took this kind of weird... Almost like, not nine and a half weeks, but... Yeah, no, it's... The ending is... I will say that the ending is not good, but I highly recommend everyone... It is streaming on HBO Max right now, and it is... It is? Yeah, it is. It's available, and it's very enjoyable. I told... I'm telling everyone to watch it this week. Well, I want to watch it because I was really upset about that ending. I mean, I literally... I got to go back. I had 15 pages of dialogue. I had 15 pages of stuff I was sending to Philip Noyce. And I felt the ending was critical. You want an ending that's really powerful. You know, you think of all Hitchcock's films, whether it's Shadow of a Doubt or Notorious or Rear Window. or Mm -hmm. It was definitely going in the like voyeur rear window, like psychological thriller direction, but it didn't pay off. I think that was an issue going into the film. There was a lot going on with that ending and... Mm -hmm. I have to go back and look at some of my notes, but... If you find those 15 pages, we'd love to see them. I will oh, watch I, the movie with your 15 pages. I had 15 pages of Amanda Mackey, actually, the casting director and Kathy Sandrich. They couldn't believe it. I was, like, sending Philip Noyce what I thought should be. I went, I want to produce this movie because I know that the ending... I had a brilliant ending, and I don't... I remember everything, but I, I don't know why. I'm, I'm, it was something to do with... There was a misdirect with Judy Marks. And I know that sounds like it was being self-serving to my part, but it wasn't. And somehow I had given the key to, Mm -hmm. there was a key Mm -hmm. mix up and and, and he got into my apartment and the misdirect was. um, I'm going to tell you it's better. Your ending as described is better than what made it to the final cut. So I'm ready for those pages. I I know that would be great. Like, you know, we just, we should do a seminar on what could be better scenes or endings (laughs) in movies. And here's one. We'll go back and reshoot it. Yes. A little bit a little older. That's so funny. But I loved working on that movie and it was very exciting to be working. Sharon and I had done Police Academy four together. That's oh, right, 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 that's right. Yeah. And I knew Sharon and she became a megastar from that movie. Yeah. Megastar. So Colleen, we've mentioned this before, but one of your most memorable roles is as Christy Miller, the country singer in Peter Bogdanovich's nineteen eighty one romantic comedy, They All Left, with Ben Gazzara, Audrey Hepburn, John Ritter, and the late Dorothy Stratton. Can you talk about working with Peter and getting to sing multiple songs in this big movie where you're working with Hollywood royalty like Audrey Hepburn? It was a great part, and Peter loves to tell the story because I turned it down initially. I was in a fight with him. I went, I wouldn't do this part. He said, I wrote you the part. I said, I wouldn't do this if it was the last thing I do. And I was having a big fight with him about something because I met Peter in 75, and he wrote a brilliant part for me. And I love that part. We had so much fun. And the thing that was so interesting is there was no, there were no trailers. And the reason that there were no trailers is because we didn't want to bring attention to the shoot. Robbie Mueller shot it. We didn't, we didn't want to bring attention to the fact that we were shooting in New York and it was 
really tricky. And so we had to sit anywhere we were when we were filming. And I remember in Carano's shoe store and between takes, because Audrey Hepburn and Ben Gazar were also, they were intercutting with Rizzoli's, which was right across the street. And she would just sit right on a little bench inside of the shoe store. There was no trailers. So Audrey would, there was no place for her to be private. She was unbelievable. She was the most extraordinary. And Peter Bogdanovich said, you get to nudge Audrey Hepburn on screen. You know, you get to like, huh? You know, like this towards the end of the movie. And I, she was incredible. And of course I end up with her son, Sean Ferrer at the end of the movie. So it was a great part. It was a great experience. It was so much fun. And then the singing was great because I had a friend named Eric Kaz who wrote a lot for Bonnie Raitt. And so he wrote some of those songs. You have and a great voice. Thank you so much. And John Barry wrote me the theme song yeah. in the game of death. Will this be the song I'll be singing tomorrow? Which if you look up on YouTube, you'll see me singing the song, which is a completely different style. And I loved it. And now I have like, got to get rid of this acid reflux because I love singing in it and I had like a three octave range and it was a love 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 singing and that was so much fun and I remember that at the time I was living in an apartment and Joyce Heiser was dating Bruce Springsteen and he was staying in our apartment and he was so complimentary about my singing that he, there was a guy named Barry Bell, and they wanted to get me a record deal with CBS Records with a guy named Dick Wingate. And Peter Bogdanovich at the time did not want to release any of the music. And I think because he was so distraught over Dorothy Stratton, that the decisions that he was making, and I guess that there is a, which I have to see this, the documentary called One Day Since Yesterday, which is a documentary on Dorothy Stratton, and they all laughed, and so, there was a huge opportunity for me to have a record deal and they wanted to take the soundtrack album of that. Right. And that would have been great. But he released it through his own. Peter took the movie away from Fox and we, it should have been theatrically released, but Peter bought the movie back and tried to release right. it himself. It went through millions and millions of dollars. But it's very hard to distribute your own movie. Yeah. You spend more on the, the, the distribution of it than the movie. But I love the experience. I love Dorothy we became very close and actually recently peter gave me a script on gershwin that he and louise stratton dorothy's sister are producing and mm. i brought it with peter to to kim morgan and guillermo del toro who really liked the script so we'll see what happens into it as you said i mean the legacy of the film has become wrapped up sort of with the death of dorothy stratton who was of course murdered by her estranged husband before the film was released i mean as you said you were close with her how did that sort of tragedy and living through that and then as you said peter sort of taking the movie into his own hands and releasing it sort of with his own budget how did all of that sort of inform your relationship to this movie which was a really great role for you having to sort of reckon with that after the fact I think my biggest disappointment was I was offered the lead role in Stand By Your Man and Peter would not sanction that. He said, oh, you're singing and they all laughed and so I don't want you to be playing Tammy Wynette and oh. I turned the part down and I'll never forget doing this reading with Cooper Huckabee and Jean Guest was at CBS. They were furious that I turned the role down and then ironically, Annette Toole was great, who I'd met and smiled at the role and it was a very bad career decision it affected me at CBS and I turned this down but Peter said no 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 I want you to be a breakout performer and they all laughed so the intention was great he hired a guy named Ray Ruff and Ray Ruff did the uh, made the soundtrack deals and it was not ever able to be realized on the level we wanted it it played at the music hall for about 16 weeks played in Seattle for 16 weeks and so not unlike Clue, but in a different way, what was bittersweet is that sometimes movies that you don't expect are going to be those movies like, say, you're doing Wayne's World and it becomes a phenomenon or Police Academy becomes a phenomenon. And then you do a movie like They All Laugh, which is a classic and Quentin Tarantino's favorite Bogdanovich film. And you do, you know, a movie like Clue, but somehow because all the stars aren't aligned with the way it's marketed or it doesn't tap into the audience at the time, and that's happened with movies like, I'm not sure if, if It's a Wonderful Life at the time. I don't know, is it, It's a Wonderful Life at the time a huge hit? Or, I, I think there's some movies that, that become like 
amazing hits later but weren't at the time yeah how the movie because peter there's no way peter could have potentially released a movie with his own funds he, he needed a, a, a machinery behind it and i think it was a huge mistake to buy that movie back in relation to they all laughed colleen can i ask you know bob fossey then went yes. on to make a movie called star, star 80. 80 about the situation with dorothy stratton did you ever see that movie and like what was the in crowd sort of reaction to him making that movie so soon after it happened because he like made that movie in 83. I saw Star 80. I think Bob Fosse's a genius. I think that it didn't delve into the Dorothy I knew. And I think it's very hard. I think Peter Bogdanovich was very upset about that movie being made. Yeah. For many, 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 many reasons. And I think that he was devastated. But there's a lot more to that. And see, I knew Dorothy very well on that film. And so... I, when I saw the movie, I never met Paul Snyder. So I can't speak to the Paul Snyder aspect of it. I know a friend of mine named Eileen Feldman is a brilliant manager agent, knew Paul. I did feel an inherent danger about him because I remember that Roseanne Caton, who I'd done a movie with called Ebony, Ivory and Jade, told me that Paul Snyder was dangerous. Mm. And I thought Eric Roberts was very brilliant. And I think people love that movie. There's something about Dorothy that was very pure. It's very Marilyn Monroe-like. There was a sweetness about her. It's ironic that Marilyn Monroe did that first calendar in Playboy. It's weird. I saw the movie once, but I don't remember it that well. And I remember movies very well. And maybe because while I was watching the movie, I was commenting on what seemed real or not real. I really, you know, isn't that funny? And I remember at the time Peter was writing the book, The Killing of the Unicorn. That whole period was very tragic because I had a very bad instinct when Roseanne Caton told me that the guy was dangerous. And I told both Dorothy and Peter this mm. at the time. And they didn't seem, she didn't seem to think that he was dangerous. But I, I, I had a feeling he was just based on a mutual friend who ended up being a playmate, Roseanne Caton. So I I think Mariel Hemingway was very good in the part, but Dorothy, there was just a quality, and I think she was excellent in the part. I think there was something in Dorothy, that knowing Dorothy, she was, she was very smart in, in, in a certain way, Dorothy. Very practical. She didn't hang on to things. She was not a hypocrite. She never said anything negative about Paul Snyder. She said that he had launched her career, that she was working in a Dairy Queen. She didn't have huge options, she thought. She could have been a big Eileen Ford model, probably, but, you know, she was so beautiful and statuesque. You'd walk down a street with her and, you know, everybody would just go, oh, my God. That was interesting to me because she pulled focus like I've never seen. Mm. She was so beautiful, breathtakingly beautiful. In a way that Ana de Armas also pulls focus. She's so, st she's so beautiful. But I think that movie at the time when I saw it, it didn't resonate to me knowing her and having experienced the aftermath of her death and all the people that were affected by it and I always thought there's so many people that were affected by her death it was a much bigger story than just the murder itself because there were so many people like her sister whose story was just unbelievable and you know so many people around her that were affected her mother there was a lot of people that are still being affected. I actually saw her sister Louise on Sunday because of this Gershwin project. Mm -hmm. So I'm not answering your question that well because I I don't remember the movie in that in that big of a way. And I think because I probably was processing things while I was watching it. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes complete sense. I mean that's so much trauma to have lived through and then oh my the sort of meta theatricality of watching this piece so recently after. I mean it's very yeah, it's, it's rough. It's very rough. Very. Okay, Colleen, we have to round out. We're almost done. We're almost going to let you go. But we have to round out part of this interview with one of the most exciting discoveries that we found while we were doing our research, which is your performance in the Betty Davis film, the 1989 Dark Comedy, Wicked Stepmother. You headlined this film 
But Betty left in the middle of the shoot, and therefore she really only stars in like the first third of the film. And through a series of sort of convoluted plot twists, the film tries to cover up her absence. She becomes a cat. Barbara Carrera comes in as her daughter. Rumor has it that Betty hated how she was being photographed, but the official like press release was that it was like, quote unquote, dental surgery. How difficult was this for you as an actor with this script ever changing? And what was it like working with this screen legend in her last film role? Well, she actually chose me for the part. Larry Cohen <gasps> oh, cool. wanted me. Larry Cohen thought I was a great idea for it. And Betty Davis cast me on the spot. I met with Betty. And she thought I was, she said, you're a great character actress. I've seen a lot of your movies and I think you're great. So Betty and I got along very well. And there was a woman that worked with her named Catherine Shermack. I love Betty. I think that she was having a lot of problems with her teeth. And I think that that tied into the way she was being photographed Mm -hmm. because she was having huge problems when she worked a week on the movie. And I also think that she probably didn't in her mind look as well as she wanted to look and she was having terrible problems with her teeth and so in the way she was being photographed i think that tied into the fact that if you have you know if i have a meniscus tear and i'm working on a tiffany haddish kevin hart you know chris spencer movie with wesley snipes and i'm walking strangely i they used like a a leg little thing so that I could play with the meniscus tear, in a sense, if that makes sense. I think that... Um, you used it, essentially. And I think it was hard for her to use that she was having. She didn't say, I'm going to have problems. So it was hard for her to talk as well as she wanted to articulate because she it was a bridge issue. That's true. And it was shocking when she left after a week. I was very sad when Betty left the movie. And I had known Barbara Carrera for years. I had met her when I was 21 years old. And I had met her when she had done The Island of Dr. Moreau. And so I loved Barbara and we were actually personal friends. So I was very happy she was coming into the movie. I've got to go back and see the movie right now because they had to change a lot of the plot. Yeah. And they had to change everything based on the fact that Betty was no longer in the movie, if that makes sense. Oh, my God. We had such a ball watching it. We were like so, uh, we don't know what we thought we were getting in store for, but we were very excited by it. People love this movie, and, 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 and I've got to see, I remember this one scene, this whole scene on the roof of a car with a detective, and I, mm-hmm. I, 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 there, was, there were some very funny things in that movie. And me going to that evil eye place to, you know, or, you know, that, that psychic eye or whatever, there were some very funny things in the movie. Yeah, and Tom Bosley. <laughs> Tom Bosley was fantastic. Love so much. Oh, loved him, loved him. There was great stuff in that movie. Highly recommend it. It's a great Halloween film. Okay. Colleen, we've reached the part of the show that we like to call the rapid fire. Okay. So we're just going to fire things off at you as quickly as possible. And you give us your best rapid fire. Okay. You have an incredible scene opposite Barbara Streisand in Funny Lady, the 1975 sequel to Funny Girl directed by Herbert Ross, where she walks in on you in James Caan's bed and you are gushing over meeting the Fanny Bryce. You're both so funny in this scene, but what was Barbara, who was already an enormous worldwide star at that point, like as a scene partner? She seems to really be playing off of what you're giving her. Uh, She absolutely was fantastic. She recently, about three years ago, said she saw the movie again and said, I love you in that movie. And it was Nora Kay, yeah. Herbert Ross's um, wife, that asked me to do it in a Southern accent. She was totally pleasant. She was really great. My first kind of wonderful opportunity. And I love her. And we've remained friendly. And she's always been very effusive about that part and me in it. Really so good. Highly recommend. I mean, we're going to link out to that scene specifically. You were contracted to Apocalypse Now for a year and were coming and going from the Philippines for the entire shoot. In the final cut, you were in the film for like three minutes dancing to Suzy Q, but you've said you got to spend some real quality time with Marlon Brando during the shoot. What was the most unexpected thing you learned about Marlon? The interesting thing is I never got to see Marlon on the movie. I actually met him personally after the movie when we were at Casa Vega restaurant with my boyfriend at the time who I met on the movie and I fell madly in love with Dean Tavalera's and Marlon was a huge fan of Dean Tavalera's and we'd go to Casa Vega restaurant in the valley and he asked me if I knew what the word Fay meant F-E-Y and he was really interesting because he 
was a connoisseur of words. He loved words. I thought it was interesting that when he met me, and I'll tell you, I'm trying to look this up because it was really interesting, that he was interested in language. And probably because actors are always looking for adjectives. They're always looking for what is the character, what is the definition of something, we want to understand what that means. And so I also thought he was very thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And he seemed to be, there wasn't a pretense to him. He was very real and he was very, um, it was clear that he was very precise in the way he approached things. Yeah. And I think that when he was on the set of Apocalypse Now, it was a very hard thing for Francis Coppola because he came there and Marlon was worried about the way he was going to be photographed because he was overweight, I think, and I think that he felt insecure about that, though I don't know that for a fact. I really never met him on the set because the scenes I shot, even though I was on the movie for a year, I was also, I came back when the typhoon hit. I was very lucky because I was supposed to be in the Philippines. I was shooting Rich Man, Poor Man, and then I came back and I wasn't there when Marlon was there. That's not a rapid fire answer, but it's a little longer. No, 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 no. <laughs> we are into it. These are good details. These are good details. Okay. Colleen, you show up in Die Hard with a Vengeance with this curly blonde hair and a New York accent, and you were unrecognizable to me except for your excellent comedic timing. You were basically the only woman on that set. Was it fun and full of explosions or a technical nightmare? It was phenomenal. It was great. I was emulating a character named Angela Amato, who was a, a cop. Her lethal weapon is her mouth. And John McTiernan on my birthday said, I've cast you in Die Hard 3 as this female cop, Connie Kowalski. And I said, you did? He said, yeah, I'm taking a male part and turning it into a female part. Loved it, had a great time. And I did two films with McTiernan and that and a cameo in Last Action here. Loved it. Mm. Okay, final question from us. We are obsessed with the fact that you starred, quote unquote, opposite Bruce Lee six years after he died. This is, of course, the now famous 1978 film Game of Death, which used archival footage from the original 1972 shoot with a very much alive Bruce Lee and then finished the film in 1978 after he had already died by superimposing his head on body doubles. This was fairly early on in your career. So did you know at the time how fucking strange it was or were you just like, okay, this is my job? No, I thought it was very strange. (laughs) I thought it was very strange. I went, how am I going to opposite? And what was particularly funny is that one of the characters that was emulating him was a, was a stuntman, but one of them was a dentist by profession. So, oh and, and when you go back and look at the movie and some of the scenes, it looks like I'm in the same loop, like Billy, karate chop, karate chop, Billy. So it was like they used the same shot. No, it was very, very strange. And then especially when they take me crying at his funeral and they use real funeral footage of Bruce Lee. So mm. it was a very odd experience. Yeah. But it was also a great some experience. of the doubles look nothing like him, like literally... No. Well he's, one of, well, he's one of the most charismatic genius stars in the world. And yeah. it was really later in retrospect that I got to really admire him and the genius of Bruce Lee. Yeah. But I will say it's very funny when John Landis did a screening of uh, The Game of Death and Animal House was a monumental hit. But Game of Death was a hit, too. Mm. Yeah. I, I remember that all of Hollywood Boulevard was, was closed off. It's very interesting that I don't remember... You know, it was so interesting because here that was a phenomenon. It was Bruce Lee Day. It declared Bruce Lee Day. So it was a great experience. And I feel very fortunate that at a young age, I was able to go to the Philippines and I was able to go to Hong Kong. And I was able to go to Canton, China. And I was mm-hmm. able to go to locations that informed me. I mean, there was martial law in the Philippines. There was, so I was able to experience different cultures. And I think that because I was on films that took risks, like when you were on a film like Apocalypse Now, and you see what someone is really taking a risk, it really informs the movies you do. And you're not a pampered pooch. You know, you, you, you know, when I worked with Roman Coppola in this movie with Bill Murray and everybody was played his wife and we're all just in trailers. There's no trailers, there was one honey wagon. We're all in little rooms. It was just, there's something, there's a camaraderie. And that was the feeling you got on Apocalypse Now when you all band together and you see that somebody's risked everything in their life to make that movie happen. And it's a masterpiece. So I think Game of Death is just fun and quirky and Ang Lee loves that movie. And when Mm. Ang Lee cast me in the ice storm and I was cast in the movie and then I was doing a a movie with Kirstie Alley and then 
the day that we were, then I went back and he wrote me a different part and then there was an actual ice storm. I mean, I'm not kidding you. And I ended, we never ended up shooting my part. But if you look in the movie, I think my name is actually in the movie. Yeah, you're credited uh, in the like, film, yeah. I'm credited in the movie. It's hysterical. But was the scene seems <laughs> never stop. Wow. That's really funny. But Ang Lee was a big fan of the Game of Death. There are a lot of people that love that movie. I was glad to see it. Yeah, I was glad to now. see you acting opposite those doubles. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Colleen Camp, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you. I didn't want to mention at the top of the episode, but I do think it's important for listeners to know that Wicked Stepmother, starring Colleen Camp and Betty Davis, is incredible. Mm. It's one of the few things Anne and I have actually like watched together recently to prepare for an interview, and it was a wild ride. It is so wacky and like it was actually very joyful for us but it's like insane you literally see them rewriting the movie as it's happening because Betty Davis just <laughs> stops showing up so it's yeah. fascinating also Valley Girl was such a high for me you know Colleen plays the lead character's mother but then getting to hear her talk about the ways in which she helped Martha Coolidge put it all together was very cool because the movie is I thought was like a really well done teen movie and Martha Coolidge in my research for the interview had talked about the way she sort of like got the job was that the studio had requested that she show like topless girls like five or six times. And she was like, yeah, 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 no problem. And then, of course, like she is a woman director directing all of these young women and the ways in which the nudity is handled is like so expertly done. And it made me like love Martha Coolidge. So then getting to hear about Colleen's like working with Martha to make it all come together was like really beautiful. So highly recommend those two pieces because I think that it'll make you appreciate those stories all the more. She was a class act, so charming, really lovely. And then, of course, she graced us with the French accent to open the episode. Oh, my God, we didn't so, even talk about trooper. the French accent. Yes, we <laughs> and, and saddled that on her at the very last minute. And she was like, oh, you're so cute. Sure. And then and then he did it. You know, it's so hard. You have to read the room. It's like I went to see Whoopi Goldberg do a show that was basically just like her talking for an hour and a half and then doing Q&A. And she said at the top of the Q&A, never ask me to say any lines from my movies ever. I won't do it. And like four questions in, somebody goes up to this microphone at this huge theater that holds like 3,000 people and was like, uh, can you just say Mufasa? <laughs> she was like, literally leave. Literally leave. So you have to read the room. And I felt like Colleen was game <laughs> and was being really generous. And so I felt like in some version, I was asking her to say Mufasa. But, you know, she she did the wee oui, wee oui, madame. You know, it was really, I don't know what else we could have asked for. She was a delight. Beautiful people. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the Colleen episode. If you know our show, you know that is the time where we drop a little blind item where we promote the show for next week. And we don't tell you who it's going to be, but we connect this week's guest, Colleen Camp, to next week's, and then you see if you can solve the clue. Ah, Damien, I think you have those details for us. Can you connect Colleen Camp through movies she's been in with other women to next week's guest? Yeah, baby, I sure can. It's about through 25 different connections. Here we go. <laughs> yes, th these are the ones I love. The more convoluted, the better. Colleen was in Clue with former guest of this show, Leslie Ann Warren, who was in Victor Victoria with Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews was in The Princess Diaries with Anne Hathaway. Anne was in The Devil Wears Prada with Emily Blunt, who headlined the Jane Austen Book Club with former guest of this show, Amy Brenneman. Amy Brenneman was in Heat with Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd was in The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood with Ellen Burstyn. Ellen Burstyn was in Requiem for a Dream with Jennifer Connelly, who's in The House of Sand and Fog with another former guest of this show, Sheree Agdashlu, who was in 24 with Jean Smart, who starred in Hacks with next week's guest. Woo! Ooh -hoo -hoo. Boy, when next week's guest <laughs> showed up on that episode of Hacks, I said, ooh, la we had just been talking about her and there she was. It is a doozy. Next week really is, I think, one of my favorite conversations we've had in some time. So I hope that you can solve that riddle. Riddle me this, folks. Will you follow us on social media? <laughs> you can find me at Damian Bellino. That's Damian with an A. And you can find my long and strong co-host over here at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. 
you might know her from is produced by us. That's Damian Bellino and Ann Rodeman. We want to thank our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. That's Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears for all they do. They help keep us on track, keep us inspired. We love you. Happy New Year to both of you. And all of that silky smooth gorgeous editing that you hear is courtesy of the great Daniel Sears. Special thanks to Gang. All that music you hear underscoring each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is by Gang. You can download and stream Gang's music wherever you get your stuff. If you want details on this episode, go to the show notes. That's where I uploaded the very clip of Colleen Camp with Barbara Streisand in Funny Lady to YouTube just for our show notes. They exist there for your knowledge. So if you need to do a deep dive on Colleen, you know where to go. Go to the show notes, babe. I was just thinking about how Colleen starred in Game of Death opposite a bunch of people that were not Bruce Lee, but they just like were pretending that it was Bruce Lee. Like, would you want that done if you died just to like have other people playing you in the film? Like, would you want the movie to be made? I would want the movie to be all about me. So I would want it to like end at the point where I was dead and it would be like this movie was discontinued because the star died. <laughs>